First, I just wanted to welcome everybody to Prime Time for Women. This is uh, our community of adventurous, spirited women uh, who we really believe have um, the desire to empower themselves to live life to the fullest. It's kind of like the exciting place for women in their prime to meet, to be seen, and to be heard, because every woman deserves to be seen and heard. Um, it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Vivian Brown. She, uh, as I'm not sure if you all were here when I introduced her a little bit before, but she is an international speaker, a pioneer, an advocate uh, for women's health and also for healthy aging. In 2012, she was named the Physician of the Year by the Ontario College of Family Medicine. And in 2018, she was the, um, the North American Menopause Society awarded Dr. Brown the Media Award because she has worked tirelessly to raise awareness um, about women's health issues. She joins us today to discuss her latest book. I think um, Vivian that came out on February 16th, is that correct? Yeah. Yep, February 16th, brand new book. Um, and um, I got to read it in advance. And I have to tell you, um, and she'll, she'll probably tell you too, but it's so readable. You do not need an encyclopedia to make sense of this book, to have it speak into your life. Um, so um, Dr. Brown, she's going to share a little bit about her story of being a woman in her prime. She'll also uh, reassure us about what's possible uh, and what we have control over. And uh, believe it or not, there's a lot that we can control. And then she's also going to encourage us to um, get on the path and journey to this uh, process of healthy aging. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Brown. Bernadette, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. And I know everybody's got competing events and, uh, and lots of demands. And so thank you all for being with me. I thought we'd start by doing a little quiz. You know, I've sort of spent so many years in school, everything starts with an exam, but this is relatively easy. You're a small group and it's all true or false answers. So you can write down your answers. You don't need to call them out loud and let's just see how comfortable you are with some of the information. So the first question is about sleep hygiene. And sleep hygiene is all about being clean, infectious, infection-free, and safe from COVID. It's true or false? No. Okay. okay. The second question. We know that stress has a serious emotional impact on the person, but not a physical one. True or false? <laughs> <laughs> Third question. Exercise improves blood flow to the heart. True or false? Fourth question. Exercise lowers your risk of dementia. True or false? Question five, exercise lowers your risk of hot flashes and night sweats. True or false? And question six, it is acceptable to have wine daily on the mind diet. True or false? So those are the questions, and now we have an option. We can quickly go through the answers, or you can wait, and as I do the presentation, the answers will come up. Which would you prefer? I'd, I'd like you to go through the answers now. <laughs> okay. So sleep hygiene is all about being clean, infection-free, and safe from COVID. True or false? What do you think? False. 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 Well, it's true. It's it's true and false. Sleep sleep hygiene refers to patterns you do before you go to sleep, and I'm going to talk about that so you get a better night's rest. It has nothing to do with infection or cleanliness. Um, we know that stress has a serious emotional impact on the person, but does it have a physical impact? 
True or false? Yes, True. it does. Shit. True. 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 Come on back. It has a physical oh. impact. It does affect your body. It affects telomeres. It has to do with aging. It has to do with your immune system. I'm gonna talk about that in a few minutes. Exercise improves blood flow to the heart. True or false? This is an easy one. True. True. Exercise, really important for the heart. Exercise lowers your risk of dementia. True. True. Yes, what's good for your heart is usually good for your brain. So yes, exercise lowers your risk of dementia. Exercise lowers your risk of hot flashes and night sweats. False. True. What do you think? Not in my experience. Me neither. <laughs> Statistically, according to the information, according to the research, exercise does not have an impact on menopausal symptoms like that. Wow. It's important to be healthy. We, we want to do exercise for lots of good reasons, but it's not going to make a difference in terms of hot flashes and night sweats in large studies. And okay. I have Last a question. Vivian, I was one of those people who thought if I sweated enough during the day, then I wouldn't sweat at night. And it definitely it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and the last question is, it is acceptable to have wine daily on the mind diet. What do you think? False. Yeah. It's true. You can have a small serving of wine daily on the mind diet, uh, which is great. Um, we need to be very careful about what we say is a serving. And, you know, you sometimes see people with an oversized glass and an oversized glass can be two or three servings. So yes, the MIND diet, which is a combination of a Mediterranean diet as well as the DASH diet. I'll speak about that in a few minutes. It's really a diet that's designed to lower your risk of dementia. And yes, you can have either a serving of grapes or a serving of wine daily. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we're going to talk about. And um, what I thought I would do is I'll, I'll leave it to Bernadette to sort of set the stage. And let's talk a little bit about the book. Yeah, so what I did was I went through and I talked with a bunch of women and I also read the book and I've come up with some questions from each chapter, but because we are a small intimate group, if there's a lull in the conversation, feel free to unmute yourself and put a question to Dr. Brown or you can write it in the chat and I'll do my very best to make sure that I get that, that question to Dr. Brown. So uh, I, Vivian, I wanted to ask you, at the beginning of your book, you quote Oliver Wendell Holmes. Uh, the quote is, I find the great thing in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we're moving. Can you tell us why that was so important to you to put that uh, right in the beginning of your book? I think I see healthy aging as a journey, as a process. It's not something you achieve today and then you know, you're done. It's really how you're moving forward. And so wherever you're starting from, maybe you've been healthy all your life, or maybe you've had some major event and you've decided it's time to take control of your life. It doesn't matter where you're starting from. It matters which direction you're going in. And so I would encourage everyone to look to see where they are, to have an idea of where they stand, what their major issues are. And even by just joining this call today, you're already moving in the right direction. You know, one of the things that we know in terms of risk of dementia is when people are too isolated. And one of the things that's really important is social connectedness. New learning is really important. So being on this call, you've already done something for your brain. You're learning new things, you're socially connected. And this speaks to me to be the direction you're going in as you make these kinds of choices to spend you know, an hour learning something else or deciding what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So that, I'm so glad you said that because that is the scientific basis for why we uh, for why we started Prime Time for Women. That women with strong social connections, uh, according to one article I read, uh, and this was a journal article, not something in a magazine, uh, they have lower risk of diabetes, depression, dementia, just because of that social connection and that they live on average seven years longer than women who are in isolated positions. Yeah. And so we're looking to create that community so we all have uh, not only live longer, but live more fully and happier. 
And I'll give you another example, Bernadette. If you're learning a new language and you buy one of these, you know, learn a language on tape and you're listening, that's very different than if you're in a classroom with people and you're starting to learn how to converse with each other. Right. That social connectedness improves your learning, improves your ability, and improves your emotional mindset. So social connectedness has been very difficult this year. People are very isolated. Not everybody has internet. Not everybody has a computer. Some of our northern communities are very, very isolated. And so I think it's really important that you appreciate the value of something like FaceTiming with a friend as opposed to just sending a text message. Right. Yeah, great point, great point. Um, Dr. Brown, it, you also, in the beginning of your book, you talk about uh, the importance of clear communication with the patient and, a, and her doctor. And you specifically say that um, it, you wrote the book in the format and in the style you did to kind of model the way it is that uh, hopefully readers of this book take to their next appointment with their doctor. Could you, um, are there certain qualities that you look for when you are talking with the patient uh, that signifies to you that they are really in conversation, in relationship, and not just dropping in yeah. and dropping out? So, so I think one of the things, unfortunately, that doctors do is we don't listen very well. You know, doctors very much want to get out the risks and benefits of a medication. And, you know, yes, you have to go on this and this is how many times a day you're, you're going to take it. But sometimes that all goes over the patient's head because they don't really appreciate what, what the story is all about. And I'll just use the example of blood pressure medication. When we start people on blood pressure medication, they often stop taking it. They don't feel their blood pressure is high. They don't like the... Um, the side effects of medication. And so when I'm having a conversation with someone, I usually have the discussion, this is not about the numbers. It's not about whether you're 130 over 80 or you're 135 over 82. What this is all about is decreasing your risk of a stroke or heart attack. The reason we treat blood pressure is to prevent a stroke or heart attack. That's very different than telling a patient, your goal is to get to this number and you have to be on the medication to get to this number. And then they take their pressure at home and the number's not far off from what I told them it had to be. And they sort of miss the boat. They miss understanding what the conversation is all about. So when I talk about communication, I think it works on both sides. Doctors need to listen and need to explain things in a better, more, uh, more understandable way. And patients need to appreciate what the goal is of whatever it is we're treating. And I like the blood pressure um, analogy because everybody can know their numbers and take their pressure at home, and, but they need to understand it's all about heart attack and stroke prevention. It's not about the numbers. Okay, well, I, that is really something that we can take all of us can take forward in uh, all aspects of our lives. And um, I think when, when I hear you say that, I think about to, back to my kids. When they were little, I would give them, you know, uh, direction about it's, it's important to do this, this, and this. And they would do it in that very limited situation. And of course, I meant it much broader. Right. Uh, but, uh, so there is a difference between sticking to the letter and to the spirit of the advice. So thank you for that. Um, in your book, you talk about nutrition rather than diet. And um, you kind of make diet sound like a, a bad word. <laughs> it's got the word die in it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, right. It's got the word diet. Okay. So can you talk about your winning strategy to maintaining a healthy weight with the non-diet approach? So, uh, you know, my daughter's a dietitian. so full disclosure, I've <laughs> learned a lot from her. She is a diabetes educator. Uh, actually, she is um, the medical um, lead on teaching for a certain company on teaching people how to use insulin pumps. Um, but the whole issue is that you want to be eating on a day-to-day -day basis to give yourself the best health. And what that means and what people really do, uh, according to my daughter, is there's this 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the time you're supposed to make the very best choices you can so that 20% of the time you can be a, a little more easygoing and 
you know, maybe you didn't have time to go grocery shopping or whatever. But the idea of eating for health is very different than um, being on a quote unquote diet. I think when we're eating for our health, we're making the choices of foods that uh, help us in many ways, the antioxidants, things like blueberries and broccoli are very good for your brain. Well, when you eat it, your brain doesn't feel better, but you feel better knowing that you're making a good choice. So I like to, I like to talk about eating in a healthy way. I like to encourage people, for example, to eat fish on a regular basis. Now I have some patients that won't eat fish no matter what. Okay, then you can take omega-3 and you'll get an antioxidant effect from that. But healthier to eat fatty fish. It's healthier to eat, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables. And so in Canada, there's a Canadian guide about healthy eating that says, if you look at a plate and you divide it in four, half of that plate should be fruits and vegetables. A quarter of that plate should be protein, whatever proteins you like, and a quarter of it could be starches. So if you're thinking like that and thinking of the rainbow, you wanna eat lots of different colored things, yellow peppers and green, green broccoli and, and that kind of thing. When you're trying to lose weight, you wanna make the plate smaller, but you don't wanna eliminate anything on the plate. Um, and so I think the whole idea is not to be in a war with food, but rather look at it as nutrition for you, for your family, for the people you care about and plan what you're eating so that you're not last minute. I mean, I work in a very busy office. I end up making hard boiled eggs on Sunday night and I often will grab hard boiled eggs and apple and a yogurt and take it to the office for lunch. That's much better than me going on Uber Eats and getting something delivered that's going to be much higher calorie, much higher in fat, and not as healthy a choice. So even when you have no time, if you've had a little bit of planning, you can make some choices. Yeah, Marsha, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just, I, I love what you're saying about food. And um, lately, I've just, my mantra is like, get away from the highly processed carbs, especially, and the beautiful packages that are put in front of our faces on the shelves at the supermarket, cookies, crackers, cereal, yep. uh, cakes. Yeah. That's I, I, we've grown up with that stuff our whole lives. It tastes good. We love sugar, sugar, sugar. And yeah. it's, it's just really kind of criminal that the food industry is putting these beautiful packages with this yeah. nutritionally zero food in front of us. In general, when you go to the supermarket, if you stay on the outside aisles and don't go up and down the inside aisles, you'll hit dairy and fruits and vegetables and meats and fish, and you'll avoid the package, excuse me, the packaged goods because it is tempting, it is easy, and uh, it's really a North American way of thinking. In other countries, they don't do that. They shop one day at a time, they buy fresh whatever, and they don't have a, a well-stocked fridge. They really buy what they need for uh, you know, one or two meals. So I think it is important to eat that way. And I suggest that my patients do a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy by answering two questions. When they go to the fridge, the first question is, am I really hungry? Am I really hungry or am I bored? Am I lonely? Am I you know, aggravated, am I really hungry? Thirsty, am I thirsty? Yeah, and then when they go for something, whatever that something is, the second question is, is this my best choice? That's, I think that that's really uh, kind of in a nutshell can shape your day-to-day -day routine, right? Um, yeah. I think the other, the other bit of advice that I learned years ago, and I, I really, I'm pretty rigid about it actually, is if I wanna eat it, no matter whether it's good for me or bad for me, am I willing to sit down at the table? And if I'm not gonna sit at the table, then I don't eat it. And if it's important enough to, for me to eat those cookies, I have to sit at the table. And that yeah. just, it eliminates a lot for me uh, a lot of that. Uh, but Vivian, well, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about uh, vitamins and maybe supplements. Like many women in their prime uh, 
have, um, you know, the beginnings of osteoporosis, osteopenia. Right. And so uh, there are, there's Algecal, there's Strontium, there's all these products uh, that are, uh, especially for people who are hesitant to get on the biphosphonates, is that how you say it? Uh, yeah. could, could you talk about how food can help with healthy okay. bones? So one supplement that we all need, because in North America, none of us get enough sunlight. And even if you do get sunlight, you generally are wearing sunblock that blocks out the absorption of vitamin D. So everybody needs vitamin D. Every woman over the age of 50 needs a minimum of a thousand international units of vitamin D. Is it that comes D3 to, or does it matter? A, a D3 is the standard and it doesn't matter if it's drops or tablets, it's fat soluble, which means you take vitamin D with food, not on an empty stomach. And you can't possibly eat enough food that's got vitamin D in it. So as a basic, everybody, men and women, vitamin D, a thousand units to start, more if needed. And we measure vitamin D and we measure you three or six months after you've started and some people don't absorb it that well and we have to give them a higher dose. Um, I suggest that everybody take a multivitamin and the reason for that is not for the vitamins. You get the vitamins in fruits and vegetables but you may not be getting the trace minerals, things like selenium and zinc and magnesium and some of those trace minerals that are important every day, but just in very tiny amounts. So a multivitamin does that for you. And I take one from Whole Foods and it was just convenient and I got a vitamin women over 50. We don't want you taking calcium. We want you eating calcium containing foods. It's much healthier, it's better absorbed. It doesn't add up to too much calcium in your coronary arteries, the arteries to your heart. So three servings of dairy a day is what's recommended. I have a piece of cheese with breakfast. I just told you I take a yogurt for lunch. I have a latte in the afternoon and I've done my three servings of dairy in a day. For people that are uh, lactose intolerant, you can buy lactose free dairy foods. And if you can't tolerate even that, you can buy uh, things like soy milk that's got calcium added. So you can buy calcium added food. It's better absorbed than taking a tablet. Omega-3 is important for um, de uh, preventing dementia, but omega-3 is in fatty fish. If you have three servings of fish a week, you don't need more omega-3. And it's not omega-369, it's omega-3. So I encourage people to eat fish. And if you're not sure, what I do for myself is if I look at the end of the day, and I can never remember at the end of a week, did I have fish twice or three times? But every day at the end of the day, I say, did I eat fish today? Yes, I had tuna at lunch or salmon for dinner or whatever. So I take the omega-3 on days I don't eat fish. But ideally, either three servings of fish a week or omega-3. I don't recommend anything else on a daily basis. Okay. Is there, can I just ask, is there a brand or brands of multiple that you especially recommend? Uh, I'm sorry, a brand or brands of? Of multiple vitamins, anything yeah. particular? I, I think Jameson makes a good brand, and I believe that's both in the U.S. and Canada. I buy generally um, vitamins at Whole Foods because I think there's a, enough turnover that things are fresh and haven't been sitting there for a long time. Um, but the only things I take on a regular basis are vitamin D and a multiple vitamin. Well, uh, I have some more questions about this, but I wanted to check to see if any of our uh, other Participants had a question on nutrition in particular or diet uh, before I ask my next question. Um, anybody else? Marianne. Marianne. Yes, Dr. Brown, I'm a vegetarian. So um, I feel really, and I take D3, uh, you know, so I, I feel really good about most of my diet. But when you talk about the omegas, since I don't eat fish, um, what, other, what are other good sources of that? Um, the main one is fatty fish. And so if you're not eating fish, I would take the supplement. Okay. You, you also would like to check your iron levels and that can happen with people who are vegetarian is they just don't get in enough iron because the iron from vegetable sources is not as well absorbed as the iron from meat and fish. So I would suggest double checking your iron. Okay. Uh, Trish, you're, you're on mute. 
Trish? I'm back. Sorry. Um, do I, I'd like to know if if canned sardines work for this omega three? Absolutely, they're very healthy for you. Yeah. Okay. I, I just, I've discovered no. that I put, yeah I've discovered that I quite like them and and you know you can make uh, sandwiches or salads with them that uh, you know yeah. uh, uh, the same as you can with canned salmon and so yeah. um, it is a choice and I'm going. Um, I'm, I hope it's working because I, you know. <laughs> also, I, sardines I have very them. tiny little bones in them, and those bones are high in calcium. Tiny. So sardines are. I a really eat the choice. bones. Yeah. yeah, I eat bones for sure. And actually, I've discovered um, salmon nowadays. You can buy salmon that's be doesn't have the skin or the bones. You know, it's supposed to be love this lovely colored salmon, but that eliminates your. Uh, you know, a lot of your omega threes and your calcium. It, you know, you gotta have the salmon with the bones and the skin. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any anybody else? All right. Well, Dr. Brown, one of the things I was going to ask you is, you, you talk in your book. Uh, you provide a little bit of, a, I think, something that might seem counterintuitive, where you make a suggestion that. Uh, we make snacking an integral part of the way we eat. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think if you wait too long to eat and you're very, very hungry, your sugar has fallen, there's a sense of being irritable and often people overeat very quickly. And so um, when we look at snacking and healthy, healthy choices, um, it, it keeps your insulin levels more stable. You're less likely to have those highs and those lows. You'll let, you're less likely to have that level of irritability. Okay, great. Well, okay, so I thought we'd go on to chapter two, which was all about exercise and sleep. And um, what do you mean in your book, you talk about live athletic? What, what, how does that play out in everyday life? Well, often people think that exercise means having to go to the gym. And I, I don't know about your area, but I'm in Toronto, there's been a lockdown for about eight weeks already, gyms are completely closed. But the idea is exercise does not mean you have to go to the gym. Exercise is about walking, exercise is about taking the stairs, exercise is not carpooling your kids to school, but walking with them to school. Exercise is going to the park with your grandchildren and running around the park with them. So I'd like to talk about exercise as being more athletic in your day-to-day -day life as opposed to some special event that you do once a week. Now, that doesn't mean you won't benefit by say meeting with a trainer and working on posture or doing yoga or doing one of the things you like, but I try to encourage people to start doing something daily, not occasionally. Okay. Um, maybe what I can do is put a question to everybody out there. Is there something that you do on a, re a regular daily basis uh, mm -hmm. that might uh, you could share with us that would encourage and inspire the rest of us? Marsha, what do you do? Um, I try to walk almost every day. It doesn't always work out, but if it's like three feet of snow or a sleet storm, but for the most part, I'll take at least a 30 or 45 minute walk outdoors. I don't want any music. I don't want to listen to books. Some people love it. That's fine. I just like to listen to the birds and the wind in the trees and mentally and physically, it just feels so good. And I try to, you know, walk at a pretty good pace. I don't, sometimes I do more than others. And the most recent thing I've heard, uh, Dr. Brown, maybe you can comment on this, was a friend said, when you walk, every, what, five minutes or whatever, do like a little sprint, do like a fast 15 or 20 seconds or 30 seconds and then go back to normal. Yeah, it's supposed to be good for your heart. And you know, what, what I've done is I ended up getting myself a, a tracker. I'll tell you the, the name of it, a, a Fitbit, because what I found is I'd be in the office all day going room to room, seeing people, feeling like, oh my God, I've done so much today. And then I'd look at the Fitbit and I hadn't even done 2000 steps. And so sometimes being accountable for what you're doing is a motivator. So for me, when I come home from a day like that at the office, 
a, a treadmill at home and I want to get on that treadmill before I make dinner. I think what you really want to do is get into whatever pattern is going to work for you. I have a colleague that walks at 6 a.m. every morning with, with her friend. And because there's two of them, they don't want to leave the other one waiting. So they both go. Um, I would never make a commitment with somebody else because my own timetable changes too frequently. But I think you want to do what's going to work for you. And I think if you've got children in your life, you want to get them off the couch and away from the screen and away from, you know, whatever Nintendo, whatever they're playing. And you want to get them outside because our kids are becoming obese. And when I say our kids, I mean North America. Kids, obesity in children is on the rise. Diabetes in children is on, is on the rise. And it's because they become much, much more sedentary. So I think it's important to make sure there's playing outside time for you as an adult and for them as children all the time. And when my grandchildren are with me, I have uh, in, in Toronto, we have two little boys, five and seven, and they're like little puppies. If we don't get outside, they're crazy in the house. We go to the park and I don't know who is more tired after we've at the park, them or me, usually me because it's nonstop running around. But kids need that and we need that as well. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Lyon, what do you do every day? Well, <clears throat> I don't do it every day, but I do it many days. I like to dance. And so I'll turn on music while I'm doing laundry in my basement, or I'll turn on music while I'm doing other things around the house, like preparing a meal. Um, and I just dance around when I'm doing it. And it's just fun, I just enjoy it. And, and that's the whole key. You have to find something that you love. You know, uh, some things work for someone and they may not work for somebody else. So I encourage people to live actively, whatever that means for them, it's not the same for everybody. Anybody else wanna share what they're doing for uh, exercise? Um, sometimes if I can't get out, I, I do a lot what Marsha does. I um, like to get out in nature and take walks and it's nice if you have a friend that can go with you, but if you can't, I try to get in uh, two miles when I do it. Um, That's when the weather's nice, I did several. several and and what we encourage people to do is to be walking fast enough so you're a little bit sweaty and a little bit short of breath. And then your heart is getting some kind of a workout. Because if you're window shopping, and I see people walking their dogs, and the dog stops every two seconds, your heart's not getting much of a workout. You know, you may be socializing and meeting all the other people who are out with their dogs, but you need to get that heart rate up. And what that means is a little bit sweaty and a little bit short of breath. So, uh, Dr. Brown, if people are... Uh working or if they they're not getting enough exercise during the week do you recommend that they double their efforts and work out twice as hard on weekends so that term is called being a weekend warrior and working harder on the weekend increases your risk of a heart attack you're out of shape from the whole week and over stressing your body is not recommended so that's not what i would tell anyone to do i really tell them to pace it do what they can and then maintain it. And so sometimes I tell women do something, you know, Saturday and Sunday, you've got a little bit of more time for yourself and just do it two more times during the week, Tuesday and Thursday. And all of a sudden you will have done it four days a week. Nobody can do something seven days a week. That's usually difficult. There's usually other things that intervene and you don't want to do something Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then do nothing for four or five days. So you want to try and pace it. So if the weekend is your best time, do something Saturday and Sunday, but do something reasonably. And then Tuesday and Thursday, find that 30 minutes for yourself. Because the other thing I talk about, Bernadette, is that when you do something for yourself, you're not being selfish, you're being selfless. Taking care of yourself is really important so that you'll be healthy enough and well enough and agile enough to take care of others in your life. And just when you're on a plane and the flight attendant says the oxygen comes down, you put it on yourself first, and then you could put it on the person beside you. If you don't take care of yourself, you will end up being that burden to your family and to the people that you care about. So yes, you've got to find that 30 to 45 minutes twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
and then do it on the weekend. But don't double up what you do on the weekend. That's not what we're suggesting. So it, when I've done public speaking for Prime Time for Women, I have said it's not selfish to take care of yourself. It's self-loving. And you're saying it's selfless because it benefits other people too. That's so right. it's the same message. But the bottom line is, in particular, many women in their prime have not valued themselves enough to put them make themselves a priority. And I think what you're saying is that you're worth it. You deserve to take care of yourself, to make time for you, and to honor that because it's good for you. But in the long term, it's good for the people in your family, the people who love you. Absolutely. You know, nobody wants to be a burden on their family. Nobody wants to need a caregiver. The more you take care of yourself, the less needy you will be as time goes on. And, and that's a gift to your family. You're right. doing well for them by taking care of yourself. Speaking about taking care of yourself, uh, sleep is another critical area that requires us to be self-nurturing, self-caring. Um, can you talk about what sleep does for our bodies and some good tips to uh, get a good night's sleep? Yeah. Well, sleep, as you all know, is very rejuvenating and it's very important. And if you're getting consistently less than six hours a night of sleep, it's like having had six glasses of alcohol for your brain. Your brain doesn't get time to detoxify. You don't get time for your immune system to build its strength. And so sleep and sleep hygiene are really important. The term sleep hygiene refers to the pattern that you do in order to go to sleep. And so think of a baby, you know, you feed the baby, you give the baby a bath, you cuddle the baby, maybe you read a story, you turn down the lights, you put the baby in bed and night after night, you do the same thing and the baby goes to bed. You need to do that for yourself. You need to have a pattern that you follow. Some people meditate and then, um, you know, maybe they'll uh, read in bed for a little while, but you need to turn down the lights. You need to turn down the, all the screens. There's so many screens around that emit light. Your room needs to be dark. It needs to be cool. It needs to be quiet. And you don't want to be doing exercise as much as I'm telling you to exercise. You don't do it within two hours of going to sleep or you're too revved up. You really need that downtime. And you can't be in bed with your laptop on your, on your stomach saying, I'll just finish this for work tomorrow. And then, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock. Shut it off and think you're going to go to sleep. It doesn't happen that way. So you want to get into a very clear pattern of winding down which is like it's an old fashioned term for sleep hygiene, winding down so that you end up getting restful sleep. If after 15 minutes in bed, you're not sleeping, get up, go do something, go read in the living room for 10 minutes and then go back to bed. Cause just lying there tossing and turning and ruminating and getting anxious about not sleeping, is not helpful. Okay, uh, so, um... One of the things, uh, and I'm trying not to be too personal here, but uh, I was like, slept like a log almost all my life. And then when I hit menopause, I had horrific hot flashes. For, they were so bad for a while, I took uh, hormone replacement therapy. Um, and, but that, when that ended, I was back having my hot flashes and whatever. Um, so is, is poor sleep as you age? Um, I've read different things. Some uh, research says that the circadian rhythms change over time from when you're a baby and when you're a teenager, you sleep later and they might change again uh, after you're out of college and then they change again as you age. So uh, what, what, what is it about that? Is it the hormone that changes, that changes the circadian yeah. rhythm? So estrogen has an impact on temperature and estrogen has an impact on your sleep cycle. And so women often sleep poorly during menopause. But usually when menopause is finished, they can go back to a normal sleep pattern, although older people require a little bit less sleep than younger people. What I encourage people not to do is not to nap in the afternoon. It breaks up your, your circadian rhythm, it breaks up your sleep pattern. And when you get into a pattern, and, and I must say, um, Arianna Huffington has a great book on sleep. She talks about her journey and how she discovered 
that she was not helping herself by working and be, being a workaholic and only sleeping for five hours a night. Um, but she goes through some of the patterns that she went through. And, and I think it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful book. The bottom line is different things work for different people at different times. And what you want to do is you want to get into the pattern that's going to work for you. So menopause aside, because that is a, a very big change with hormonal hormonal uh, fluctuations. I think it's important that you get into a pattern for sleep hygiene to really have an effect. Occasionally, someone may need medication. Occasionally, poor sleep is really a symptom of something else. People may have, uh, you know, overwhelming anxiety. People may have chronic pain issues. People may have other issues as to why they're not sleeping. Even obstructive sleep apnea may be why they're not sleeping. So if you cannot get into a good pattern on your own, you should speak to your doctor because there are other things to do and other things to evaluate. Um, I was wondering if uh, anybody who's participating today has a question that they want to put to Dr. Brown about uh, her chapter on sleep before we move on to the next chapter, which is about brain health. And that's the one I'm really interested in. Any questions on sleep? I do find what you're saying about napping curious. I don't know why years ago I was like a big napper. I'm not at all anymore, but there are people that swear by that nap. So yeah. in general, would you say it is it is not productive for your night sleep to take a afternoon right. nap? If you absolutely have to nap, you wanna limit it to 30 minutes or less, because if you sleep an hour, an hour and a half, two hours in the afternoon, you've disrupted your sleep cycle for at night. So in general, I tell people not to nap. I tell them they can take a time out, put their feet up, listen to some music. They can take a little bit of a break from something, but I actually encourage them not to nap. Um, I think Kathy Lyon had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to mention when you were talking Dr. Brown about needing less sleep as you get older, and I've heard that from many different places, but I don't find that to be true for myself. Um, given my own, you know, rhythm and not having to get up at a certain time, I will sleep eight to nine hours and often nine hours at night. Um, I don't see that. I mean, so far that hasn't changed at all. Is that sort that's of... Just, that's just you. And some people like onions and some people don't. You know, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a hard and fast rule. It's just if you were always sleeping nine hours and suddenly now you're sleeping seven hours there wouldn't be something wrong with you, right? Just often as we get older, we may require less sleep. Um, but uh, sleep in and of itself is very different in different people. Some people have no trouble waking up early and they go to bed early. Other people prefer to stay up late. When we look at teenagers, the problem is, is they stay up too late. And we know that growth hormone works at night. So they need to go to bed early so they keep growing. So there's different hormones at different times of life that have an impact. Um, but if you're sleeping comfortably and your comfortable amount of sleep is nine hours, that's, that's just you, that's fine. Okay, thanks. So um, in your next chapter, Dr. Brown, you talk about, you say the brain is the alpha and the omega of life. Um, I, I, I thought that was such a powerful way of explaining that. And then you go on to make the case about um, brain health and what we need to do to, um, assure brain health. Can you talk about that? And then also maybe a little bit about the gender differences between the male and the female brain yeah. structure. So in general, without your brain health, you are not you, right? We, we all know somebody who suffered from dementia, suffered from Alzheimer's, and unfortunately 70% of new cases of Alzheimer's are women. Women are more at risk for depression, Women are more at risk for uh, other brain diseases like multiple sclerosis, and women are more at risk for dementia. What we want to do is we want to keep our brains healthy. And I think that's probably the most important thing that we can do. Because when you look at people, they may be physically well, but if they don't have their brain healthy, they're no longer themselves. And we all want to be ourselves as we get older. We accept getting older but we still wanna be who we are. I look at Stephen Hawking and Stephen Hawking had no physical abilities. I mean, he was so limited, but he had his brain 
and he was still himself until he died. Um, and so I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think when I talk about the alpha and the omega of life, to me, this is the starting point and, and you, you need your brain health. And so, as I said at the beginning, being socially connected is important to brain health. Eating properly is important to brain health. And we know that men and women are different. You know, for example, men have the ability to see straight ahead better than women do. Women have peripheral vision that is better. And that goes back to when we had to watch our young and men were hunters and they needed to hunt where women could see peripherally and keep an eye on the kids wherever they were. So, you know? so when my husband tells me that I'm multitasking, I'm going to say, I'm good at that. That's how my brain was designed. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we know, for example, that when women, when men speak, one area of their brain lights up. When women speak, multiple areas light up because they're getting emotional um, uh, cues at the same time. Women do multitask in a better way. Um, and what's also very interesting, and I just want to explain this to you, is not only are women more likely to get Alzheimer's and dementia, but women are not as easily diagnosed. They're diagnosed later in the spectrum of dementia. And there's a reason for that. And one of my colleagues in Chicago, Pauline Mackey, is doing some fantastic research in this area. What happens is women have verbal abilities that are better than men. Statistically, most women have better verbal abilities than most men. When you do the testing for dementia, women will test out as normal because their verbal skills are better even if they've already started to decline in their verbal skills. So by the time they're picked up, they're farther along in the decline. And what Dr. Mackey and her research group is doing is they're looking at different ways to score the tests so that women have to score differently because they're starting with better verbal ability. Because most of the drugs that we use for dementia work much better early on and not later on. So if we don't pick up women early and we don't give them a chance at the medication and they're not in the research, then they're not going to do well. So one of the things that's being looked at now is how to score the testing differently in men and women, accounting for the verbal ability that women tend to have. And I think that's fascinating because, you know, you always want scores to be equal, but being equal has to take into account where you're starting from. Otherwise, you can't appreciate the loss. So um, this goes back to years and years and years of uh, Western medicine where men were these uh, test subjects in developing diagnostic tools, uh, in basically determining uh, most of the parameters of our culture. And women have made an, an in, uh, inroad in saying no, uh, I have a different way of being in the world and it's valid. So now they're looking at doing this test. Could they do a different test or are they just looking to score the test that is already created? Yeah, they're looking at both at both options. Um, and I think it's important to know that, you know, it, with a lot of the testing on drugs, women were given two thirds of the dose of an average man. But we know with hormones and with the fact that women have different bodies and different responses to medication, that not all medications work the same in men and women, even if you dose it for weight appropriately. So one of the arguments is that women have to be represented in all of these studies appropriately. And um, we didn't talk about it, uh, but I am a board member of an organization called the Women's Brain Health Initiative. It exists in both Canada and in the US. It's a charitable organization raising money for research in women's brain health. And one of the things that we've managed in Canada is we've managed to have women, sex and gender as part of the research going on in brain health. And that's so important because you need to test the drugs in women, not just in men, because the responses may be different, even if you adjust for dosing and weight and, and that kind of thing. I'm so glad you're there advocating for that. 
That, Thank you. Perfect. Now, I have a question that was sent to me in advance of your uh, presentation, Dr. Brown. Uh, somebody wanted to know, uh, and you made reference to the MIND diet, that alcohol right. is an acceptable part according to the MIND diet. Uh, this, the question was, does al alcohol affect long-term brain health? So excess alcohol does. And we know that, you know, we know that from alcoholics, there's all kinds of encephalopathies related to alcohol. The MIND diet is looking at a four ounce serving, which is a small serving of wine. And what we know is the MIND diet is a combination of that Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet being lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, only small amounts of protein and very small amounts of fat. So that combination of the um, Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, and the DASH diet is an older heart diet, which is very low in sodium. The combination of the MIND diet came out and what they evaluated was risk of dementia. And they saw in people that followed the MIND diet, a significant reduction in dementia. And eat, what I really like about this diet, and I go into this in the book, is you don't have to follow it 100% of the time because nobody can follow anything 100% of the time. If you followed it 80% of the time or moderate, um, a moderate um, uh, um, following of the diet, you still got a benefit. And so, yes, you can be having four ounces of wine. That's a small portion. You know, when we look at countries like Italy and we look at countries like France and they have wine with lunch and wine with dinner, they're having small portions they're not having two, three glasses. That would be unusual. And so what we do in North America is, you know, we oversize everything. We oversize our meals. We oversize the amount that we're drinking. So when you look at the MIND diet, the portions are small. But okay. no, small amounts do not cause harm. Well, um, I... Um was wondering if you are a proponent of this idea that drinking wine is good for the, not only for the, made possible for the brain, but good for the heart. Uh, I, I had read a study saying that actually that uh, at one point they thought wine was good for creating a healthy heart. Um, and this study basically said that it's not so much the wine that was good for you, it's what happens when you drink wine. The, the, social connection, the dialogue. So I, where do you fall on that? You know, I, I wouldn't say that wine is medicinal. Uh, you know, I think that's going a little too far. Um, and certainly for women, you're supposed to have maximum seven to nine servings per week. If a serving is about four to five ounces, that's not having a half a bottle at dinner with your husband. You know, having a half a bottle is two and a half to three servings. So I think we have to be very careful about serving size. Mm -hmm. um, what I often tell women is if you do want to have that half a bottle with your husband, do that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but you can't do that every night of the week. Right. And so seven, seven servings per week, ideally not all in the same night, um, is what is the maximum that you can have without getting into some side effects and risk. Okay, and I'm going to uh, change a little bit of the order of this because most of the women that responded to the survey wanted you to have a chance to talk about sexuality and sex in, in your prime. So right. I'm, I'm going to, uh, towards the end of the book, uh, you start off that chapter with a quote from salt and pepper let's talk about sex baby let's talk about you and me and, and uh i love that part because you're saying that's the conversation we should be having with our doctors <laughs> so talk to us well i think the you is you and the me is your doctor because right. if everything's going fine that's great you don't need to talk about it but so many people have issues and concerns and often the patient thinks if it's important the doctor will bring it up and the doctor who may be comfortable or not that comfortable thinks if it's important, the patient will bring it up. I, I think every doctor should bring up sexual function as a routine question. And I will tell you, I was uh, quite honored to be part of a committee that wrote a guideline for doctors. It got published by the Mayo Clinic and it's very hard to publish anything in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, but it got published about a year and a half ago in the Mayo Clinic proceedings giving doctors the script as to how to ask people, are you sexually active? And if the answer is yes, is everything going okay for you? If the answer is yes, end of story. 
And if the answer is no, I'm not sexually active, is that by choice? Is there something going on? Is there something you want to talk about? Is there something I can help you with? Now, I will say as a female physician with a large community-based practice, most of my patients have been with me for years and years. So I don't find it difficult to talk about these things. I can talk about it. I can smile. We can joke. But if a woman's in for a general assessment or a well woman check or a pap test or, you know, urinary infections or whatever she's in for, I think it's fair to ask the question, are you sexually active? Is everything going okay for you? Because one of the things that we know is that sexual activity does decrease with age. Sometimes it's a problem with the partner. Sometimes it's a problem with the relationship. Sometimes it's a problem post-menopause. And not everyone is distressed by that. The reason we medicalize sexual function is when a woman is distressed. If something has changed and it's not what she wants and she's not feeling the way she wants. So I do talk in the, bo in the book about um, the decreased sexual desire screener, which is a very simple screener with a number of questions. You know, was sex good for you before? Has it changed? Are you distressed? If she, no matter how it's changed, good or bad, or more or less or whatever, if she's not distressed, it's not a medical issue. And on the other hand, if she is distressed, there's new medications, there's vag vaginal estrogen creams. Depending on what the problem is, we should talk about what the problem is because there's options to treat it. And, and what, what I have found in my own practice is when I just open up the discussion, if I just say, are you sexually active and how are things going for you? If she does want to talk about it, that gives her permission. And so often I've had someone say to me, oh my God, Dr. Brown, I thought it was just me. You know, it's not just you. It's a change and we need to address it. So I, I'm going to invite people, if they don't want to ask you a question on camera, to put, if, but you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I have some questions that some uh, from reading the book and some from some that women have sent me ahead of time. Um, but I um, just wanted you all to feel like you can be in dialogue with Dr. Brown. This is, this is uh, the essence of her book, this idea that the communication between a uh, patient and her physician is critical. She's modeling this here for us today. So if you like what you're hearing, go back to your doctor and make sure that you have a chance to ask those questions and, and tell them if they need to, they can take a look at uh, Dr. Brown's uh, published report at the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Dr. Brown, how do you define a normal sex life at this stage of life? Okay, so what is normal? There's such a wide variation. Normal is what's normal for you. Do you remember that Annie Hall movie where Woody Allen says, we hardly have sex, we're having it three times a week. <laughs> and she said, we're having sex so often, it's three times a week. <laughs> you know, what's normal is normal for you. And if you are with a partner or if you're by yourself and you're self-satisfying, Whatever is normal is what you're comfortable with. You know, I, I think we have to get away from what is normal as to say, what are you comfortable with? Because for some couple, it may be comfortable to do this once a month. And for somebody else, it may be comfortable to do something twice a week. And when I say something, I'm, I'm using that vernacular because it doesn't have to be intercourse. You know, sex can be intimacy and intimate touching, it doesn't necessarily have to be intercourse. I have a number of women that tell me their partners had some kind of prostate procedure and they don't have intercourse anymore. And my next question is, are you still intimate? Are you having oral sex? Are you touching each other? Do you still feel close? You know, so what is normal is different for different couples. There is no normal. Okay, uh, so the next question is, um... How much do what we think about sex impact our sex or is it the other way around? Sex impacts our thoughts or, or maybe uh, do thoughts impact libido or does libido impact our thoughts? What's your take you know, on that? It, it, it's, it's very, um, I think it's pretty standard to say 
that women do have a lot of brain issues around sex. You know, you can't get into it if your brain is not into it. You know, if you're worrying about the next day and did you lock the door and are the lights on, are the lights off? Am I too hot? Am I too cold? Did I put the dog out? Did I make them lunches? If that's where your left brain is going, your right brain can't get into being sexually active. And so I think it's important that it's, it's, uh, it's a pathway that goes both ways. And often women with age lose the desire to initiate sex but if they are receptive to their partner, they may be still able to enjoy and get into something. I think in a sense, we have to plan it a little bit. We have to give ourselves time and permission and that quiet time to pay attention to ourselves and to our partners. Because if we're feeling very negative about ourselves, we're not gonna be receptive to any approach from our partner. Mm -hmm. So the answer is both. Our brain helps us turn on and being turned on helps our left brain shut off. And, and what I would say is if she says we're past all that, my question is, is that by choice? Are you comfortable with that? How did this happen? In general, statistically, women, women and couples in general are less sexually active as time goes on. But we also know that one of the highest risk areas for sexually transmitted disease is Florida nursing homes. Okay, so you could be sexually active at any age if you choose to be. And what I think is the most important thing, and I, I can't remember who, who said what is normal, I think the most important thing is to normalize the conversation so that women can express whether they're comfortable with where they are or whether they're not. And sometimes when I tell women being sexually active does not mean you've had penetrative intercourse. That's not the definition. The definition is intimacy. However satisfying you find that, it's not counting up orgasms. It's whether you're intimate and feel good about it. So for some couples, it may be, you know, being close and touching and not necessarily um, going further than that, but that is still sexual. That is a sexual intimacy that I think we all want to have as we grow older. And Dr. Brown, I think that when you, when you define it that way, uh, I think it gives women um, permission not to say, I have to do it this way. And then that not being under pressure might uh, create the, the desire to explore more sexual activities. Exactly. You know, women need to be comfortable. I encourage women to talk with their partners. In my practice, I encourage women to bring in their partners. Let's talk together if you're not comfortable talking on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and often me just saying that helps her talk to her partner and they don't come in together. But I often encourage them to come together if she's feeling awkward or uncomfortable or perhaps has a new partner and is not sure how to proceed. You know, I, I have just in this year, I count up in my own practice, seven women whose husbands have died. You know, uh, one or two were COVID, others were COVID related, others were cancer related. But I have seven now quote unquote widows in my practice when each one comes in to see me, one of the things I talk about is safe sex and their next partner. And it's not that I am devaluing, devaluing the partner that they've just lost, but I'm giving her permission to start thinking about a new partner. You know, because she's what, 50, 60, 65? Women live until about 90. I've got patients in my office over 90 and they're living in the community and they still come in. And the one I like the best is the one who gets annoyed with me for being late because she's got a tennis game, you know, but <laughs> I think, I think we want to give people permission to have that conversation, whatever their situation is. So I think it's so interesting that you say uh, to women, bring your partner in and we'll discuss it together. Um, because that's like, they go home and they say to their partner, you want to go with me to talk with Dr. Brown? And they said, no, no, just 
go ahead, talk to me now. Like, you know, I mean, that, that, that's what happens. But the other thing I wanted to say is, I think, and this is one of the things I hope Prime Time for Women does is we create a safe environment for women. I really want to create a safe environment where women can talk to other women about sex. I think it was Mary Ann was saying her daughters have this ability to interact with her, with their friends. And it's a very open conversation. I, I, I have a dear friend uh, and we say, we only talk about our sexual relationships with each other. But what if you had a whole community of women where you could say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. And then we get to say, just like your patient, oh, I'm not the only one that, or, oh, there's other ways of doing this or whatever. So, you know, as, as we grow prime time for women, I hope that there is the sense that we get to learn from experts like Dr. Brown, but we also come uh, to a safe environment where we get to be uh, fully ourselves and be both vulnerable and uh, support other people who are willing to be vulnerable. So that's one of the things I wanted. And Bernadette, that, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. I wrote the book so women can say, oh, I thought it was just me and it's not just me. It's not just me with some memory loss changes. It's not just me with difficulty finding time to exercise or fighting to not eat late at night or what, whatever the issue is in general health. I wanted women to understand the overview of best choices, but also to understand where they're coming from and what makes good sense for them. So uh, in the chapter, I, I do talk um, about what women can do, but talking with someone is just so important. That social connectedness, I go back to this, it's so reassuring, but women are often very reluctant and don't feel safe. And obviously when they talk to their doctor, it is confidential. Right. So in your book, you talk about hormonal replacement uh, therapy, and you don't even call it that anymore, right? Um, no. Yep. Uh, and it, then you also uh, talk about some um, other strategies for managing um, intimacy at this stage of life. Do you want to briefly talk about some of those? Um, I, I just want to say that we don't use the term hormone replacement therapy anymore because we're not replacing the level of hormones you had when you were younger. It's now called menopausal hormone therapy, which is giving you a much smaller amount of hormone. It's much safer. And uh, overall, when we use menopausal hormone therapy, it's within 10 years of your last period or under the age of 60. So I do have women in their 60s and 70s on hormonal therapy, but they started in their 50s. We don't generally start in your 60s and 70s. We do start vaginal hormone therapy if needed because vaginal hormone therapy or local hormone therapy is another term, is poorly absorbed, which means you're not getting the systemic effect in your blood. You're not getting the risk and the side effects. You're just getting the vaginal support. And we know that's really important because if the vaginal lining breaks down as time goes on, you're more at risk for having bladder problems as well, because the back wall of the bladder is sensitive to estrogen. So you're more at risk for incontinence or not being able to hold your urine. You're more at risk for urinary infection. So even if you're no longer sexually active, but if the vagina is too dry, we do use local hormone therapy in women, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever. But we don't use systemic, we don't use oral or transdermal hormone therapy. Um, if you're starting past age 60, or 10 years from menopause. Our other options, there's a uh hyaluronic acid. There, there's a variety of different choices as to what to use. Um, and one of the problems is if you haven't been using anything for a while, the vagina gets shrunk and gets tighter. And so sometimes we use dilators and different things at different stages. This is worth seeing your doctor about because it, it's a very precise question and you'd have to go through the history and see what you've used that didn't work in order to know what to do next. But absolutely, there's still things to do. This thing's slippery, but it doesn't have stretch and give. And if there's no stretch and give in the area, it still will be painful. So water-based lubricants are good at the very beginning of menopause 
when there's still estrogen on board and there's still quite a bit of stretch and give. Um, but Marianne's description is that was a while ago. And to me, what she's describing is um, the vagina shrinking a little bit and it may need more than just that. Thank you. Bernadette, did you have any other questions for me? Because I am going to have to go in the next five minutes or so. Okay, well, um, so um, real quickly, uh, we, I wanted to go back to chapter seven on bone health. And um, uh, you have what's called a fracture risk assessment. Could you briefly talk about that? And I, I did want to ask you a, a question about strontium. I've read really good things about it and maybe not such great things about it. So, so I, I will, I'll answer the strontium question first. And that is, um, it's not being used in Canada. It's not a standard treatment. So I would not have sort of the medical expertise to answer that clearly. Um, it's an older treatment and there's much newer treatments available. So I'm not sure why someone is bringing that up at this particular time, because there's lots of other good choices. Okay. Um, in general, everybody over the age of 50 should have a fracture risk assessment. That doesn't necessarily mean a bone density. A bone density is often, often offered later at age 60 or 65. But at age 50, you want to know when your last period was, have you lost height, and have you fractured anything? Because when you start looking at that fracture assessment, what we really want to know is what can we do for bone hygiene to prevent a fracture? Unfortunately, fractures past the age 50 are very common in women. Hip fractures are about one in eight, and a hip fracture has a 25% mortality in the first year, and about a 40% chance of never walking properly for the rest of your life, and about a 28% chance of ending up in a long-term care facility. So that hip fracture is often a, a life-changing event. So starting at age 50, we want to do a fracture risk assessment. Are you getting in enough calcium? Are you taking vitamin D? Do you have any kinds of other medical problems that put your bones at risk? Something, for example, like rheumatoid arthritis or parathyroid disease or over-replacement of thyroid. You know, different things can impact bone. So you want to start working on bone hygiene um, around age 50, if not earlier, but at the latest age 50. And if you do get a bone density, we need to remember that that's looking at the amount of bone that you have. A fracture is a reflection of bone quality, not just the amount of bone, but how fragile or not fragile your bones are. And something like 80% of fractures after age 50 are considered fragility fractures. You know, if you get hit by a truck, you're allowed to break whatever you want. But if you step off the curb, you twist your ankle and you break your ankle, that's a fragility fracture. Because any fracture from the height of one to three stairs is considered a fragility fracture. If you cough and you break ribs, if you turn around and reach for something in the back seat and you stretch and you break ribs, that's a fragility fracture. If you slip on the ice and you put your hand out so that you don't hit your face on the ice and you fracture your wrist, that's a fragility fracture. So we want to do that risk assessment so that we can help women protect bones and have good bone hygiene so that when you get to be 70, 80, 90, you're living in the community, you're not in a wheelchair, and you're able to be independent. Because the other thing that I think is most important, uh, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, is healthy aging to me is being independent at whatever age you are, making your own financial decisions, your own personal decisions, your own health decisions, living in the community, not in a care facility, and being able to care for yourself and hopefully others. So when we look at bone, it's really important to understand that the most likely event for any woman over the age of 50 is, excuse me, is not breast cancer, it's not a stroke, it's not a heart attack. The most likely event a woman is going to have is a fracture. 
Okay, everybody. So uh, get Dr. Brown's book and read that chapter. Um, I, I'm, I know you have to go, and I had a question for you about the bisphosphonates, but I'm, I'm going to go back and read that chapter again. Um, so, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your expertise, but also just for being so willing to engage all of us. Uh, your warmth comes through via Zoom. Who knows? Don't you just want to go see her now? It's been a pleasure to meet these women. Um, you know, I thank you for spending time with me, and, and I'm happy to come back another time and sort of pick up the conversation where we left off. There's sort of lots about vaccine. There's lots about virtual health. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I, I think as a physician, I value the relationships more and more. You know, as a medical student coming out of medical school, all you're interested in is an interesting diagnosis, right? You want an interesting diagnosis. You've learned all about this stuff. You want to be able to recognize it. As you're in practice longer and longer, an interesting diagnosis is somebody's tragedy. You don't want an interesting diagnosis. And my feeling as a family physician is it's, it's not that every patient is my family, they're not, but I care about every patient in a way that is different than family, but different than the first couple of years out of school. Right. I care in a different way because I don't want somebody's tragedy happening on my watch. Not when I could have prevented it, not when we could have made better choices. And, and really that's what the book is all about. It's helping people understand to make those better choices so that we both can grow old together. <laughs>